Greetings everyone, I'm Stefan and today we're going to be covering the patch notes for Stellaris 3.0 and 3.0.1. As you might know, we are going straight into uh, 3.0.1 upon release on April the 15th and so I wanted to combine both of these patch notes into a single video and a single document on screen. Before we begin, I do want to encourage you to pause at any point in the video uh, to read through any of uh, the patch notes and or my annotations which are going to be in parentheses and in all caps. I've had my hands on the game for about two weeks now and uh, I've learned quite a bit from playing during this time. So let's begin by covering the Nemesis expansion. You got a few main uh, points here. You got spy networks and spy missions. Spying gives you access to a lot of operations that you can do on other empires and uh, the way they work is basically uh, like relic dig sites. You go ahead, launch an operation, and then eventually you will get it. There are random events that can pop up throughout, but most of the time, if you go ahead and do something, no matter how hard it is, you'll get it eventually. You can boost this with assets and stuff like that, but honestly, a lot of this is relatively weak. As far as I can see right now, the only things that can potentially help you out is extort favors. If uh, you, for whatever reason, are in a multiplayer game and cannot trade favors with another player, and uh, you really want to influence something in the council, you can steal technology, which gives you 30% research in a technology upon completion, uh, but it does have a 10 year cooldown. It is also quite expensive, uh, just like a lot of these other missions, so uh, the only empire you'd reasonably be conducting these operations with is a mega corporation. Otherwise, sabotaging a starbase or armoring privateers is a nice way to mess with another empire. Uh, however, they are both relatively weak and relatively uh, easy to deal with. Like, sabotaging the starbase will uh, destroy a module or a building. Like, yeah, that's great, but for 2,500 energy credits, uh, you'd rather just build up more ships to deal with the starbase. I would imagine these get a rework sometime in the future because, as they are right now, they are relatively weak. Another top feature of Nemesis is becoming the Crisis. Uh, now, this is quite involved. You take an Ascension perk, which is easy enough, but then you have to deal with Menace, research projects, and once you get through it, you have to build up an Aetherophasic engine to try to destroy the galaxy while the galaxy tries to destroy you. If you want to check out what becoming the Crisis is like, I have done a stream where I have become the Crisis, and that is going to be linked in the description. Now, if you don't want to be the bad guy, you could be a good guy, kind of. Uh, you can become the custodian of the galaxy, and uh, eventually you can become the emperor as well. This does add a whole bunch of features to the galactic community, which I will certainly cover in a separate video. Undoubtedly though, the best part of this is that you get to speed along the process and uh, get resolutions passed uh, quite a bit faster, so that is quite nice. Otherwise, you get an Imperial ship set, which you can choose at the beginning of the game, or if you become the Galactic Emperor or Custodian, uh, you get some new music tracks and new achievements, which I have personally never, uh, <laughs> I've personally never gotten a single achievement in Stellaris. Now, as far as the actual 3.0 free update goes, uh, we do get quite a lot of stuff. So first of all, Intel and First Contact. If you tuned in to the Nemesis Cold War stream, I'm sure you saw a lot of that. But, uh, when meeting a new species, it's a bit more involved than just uh, going ahead and researching a project. Whenever you're contacting something for the first time, such as a spaceborne creature or an enemy empire, uh, you can go ahead and assign an envoy to research them and uh, see who they are. This is basically a mini event chain that happens every time you meet someone new, and you can get a variety of outcomes from it. You can be friendly, you could be evil, you can dissect the creatures, or you can just let them go. Ultimately, this process is relatively unintrusive on gameplay. Uh, you assign an envoy and uh, see them discover this alien who you eventually get more intel on over time, and at the end when you actually speak to them, your dialogue makes a difference. Alongside the first contact thing, there is also the intel system, which uh, the DLC really builds off of. The intel system makes it so that you don't actually know a lot about another empire, and uh, for example, when you just meet an empire on the other side of the galaxy, you won't know their ethics, you won't know their civics, you won't know what sort of pops they have, 
and uh, what sort of diplomacy they're doing. You can genuinely be secretive about stuff, and uh, it's definitely a nice system, especially with something like an Inward Perfection Empire, which wants to just stay away from the galaxy and have nothing to do with them. Being able to hide your stats is quite a nice mechanic. As far as the economy rework goes, uh, there are three main things. Building slots, industrial districts, and pop growth and assembly. Building slots have experienced a pretty simple change. Instead of uh, requiring you to have more pops on a planet to unlock more building slots, you unlock building slots by doing various things, such as for example, uh, building more city districts. This is going to be your primary way of getting more building slots. Uh, you could also get two building slots from researching technologies, uh, potentially one from a tradition tree, and potentially one from a civic uh, that is available to normal empires and machine empires. Because there are so many ways to get building slots, uh, building buildings is relatively easy, and a lot of them do things uh, a bit differently than in 2.8. For example, uh, alloy plants and consumer goods factories are planet unique and serve only to boost industrial districts, which uh, I'll talk about later. They basically give more jobs, and uh, such a thing is possible for stuff like mineral purification hubs and energy grids. They give more jobs from your districts, and uh, honestly, this is really nice uh, for boosting your planets uh, and uh, really specializing. Any buildings that give you more jobs upon leveling them up have also been changed. For example, research labs go up by two jobs per tier. So you can go from two jobs at level one, four jobs at level two, and six jobs at level three. Uh, overall, I'd say spamming research labs and just uh, filling up building slots is probably going to be more efficient uh, than upgrading them, especially early on. Building slots are going to be a lot more readily accessible, and so doing stuff like that is going to be pretty efficient, and uh, stuff like managing special resources is going to be a lot easier. You can just build a few uh, extra city districts and plop down uh, refineries without having to worry about losing out on a bunch of research or ally output. Speaking of alloy output as well as CG output, uh, that is handled by industrial districts. Now, as a hive mind, you will only produce alloys uh, because you have no need for consumer goods. But as a normal empire, you will have industrial districts give one consumer goods job and one alloy job. You will be able to use a planet designation uh, to make that planet more focused on alloys or on consumer goods. Or alternatively, you're just going to go ahead and uh, you know just restrict certain jobs. Because of the industrial districts, you will have even more building slots open on your planets uh, to do whatever you want with them. Because of the way this whole thing is going to work, uh, what I've started doing is actually specializing my planets as soon as possible because you do have extra building slots and it's very easy to you know plop down an energy nexus and get extra energy out of your technicians. Planetary designations as a whole are also more powerful in 3.0 uh, and the bonuses are just straight up better. So specializing is really the key here. If you're new to the game, I still would recommend just building whatever you need uh, on your planets, but if you really want to squeeze stuff out of your planets, specializing them early is the way to go. This becomes especially relevant when you consider the pop growth mechanics. Uh, there's actually two main things at play here. There is uh, planetary growth and empire growth. Empire growth will mean that over time you will get less population growth in your empire. For example, on this pop, the growth progress is 396.8 out of 634. Because we have a lot of population, it takes more to grow a single pop. And this actually also applies to assembly. So assembling and growing pops is going to get significantly slower in the late game, which means you're going to have less pops, which means that having better pops is going to be better for your economy as a whole. This is somewhat counterbalanced by the increased growth you can get on your planets. Uh, first of all, planets will now have an S-curve as far as growth goes. Uh, it's basically how populations work IRL. Uh, if you have a low population, you won't really get a lot of pop growth, but as your population increases, as long as there is carrying capacity uh, in an environment, Having more pops breeding will produce more population growth, and so for example here, we're getting an additional 1.58 base growth on this planet. We have more pops breeding, uh, we can see the number go up, and for example on this planet, 
growth is doubled because we have a lot of population and we do have the planetary capacity for it. In order to maximize your pop growth, you want to make sure your population stays at below half of the planetary capacity. So for example, we have 99 planetary capacity. We want at most 50 pops on this planet for optimum growth. Of course, you won't necessarily have a lot of space on your planets and eventually they will get filled up. On a planet where you're reaching your planetary capacity, you're gonna start to have decreased growth and eventually a planet's population will level out over time. Uh, although I do have to mention that pop assembly will continue as usual. Uh, this means that normally, uh, over time your planets will fill up and you will no longer have to worry about them. So for example, uh, in this scenario right here, I have 46 planets in uh, a pretty late game scenario and uh, I'm honestly not doing a lot of planetary micromanagement. Because I have so much population in the Empire already, uh, the total population growth is severely reduced and I'm really managing the growth of about 6 planets worth of pops. Considering the new migration mechanics, where free pops uh, can potentially just move to another planet with a 10% chance every month, uh, managing planets really isn't that bad, especially when it comes to the late game. Now, having an average of one pop migrate per year is not a whole lot. Uh, you can increase this rate through uh, an edict such as greater than ourselves, uh, your government, such as with uh, a democracy, or you can increase it by having a starbase module such as the transit hub. Uh, this will increase the chances of pop resettlement dramatically, and uh, if you just spam transit hubs across all your stations, you basically will never have to worry about migration and resettlement at all. A lot of the late game in 2.8 is uh, having to manage population and resettlement, and in 3.0, the automatic migration takes care of it all, and uh, in this game, for example, I only had to touch the resettlement button once uh, when I wanted to evacuate the population of a fallen empire over to my own space. Otherwise, there are a few quality of life features. For example, manual resettling will actually have your unemployed pops at the top, which uh, is extremely convenient. You want to just shuffle pops around. Uh, you also get an auto research feature uh, so that when you're in the late game, you can just click a button and have auto research. And then text will get selected at random out of your pool uh, to be researched. This is extremely convenient and is unlocked uh, via positronic uh, AI. Well, it, it's one of those late game texts that give you plus 5% uh, research speed. Otherwise, there are a lot of changes balance wise. Uh, first of all, nice uh, quality feature, your homeworlds are bigger now. And uh, so you get an 18 to 21 size instead of a 16 to 18. And uh, Earth, by the way, is going to be a size 18 now. Uh, we already covered resettlement, but there is actually one thing to mention. Uh, if you do resettle pops, it does cost influence. Uh, not a whole lot, but it does cost influence nonetheless. Uh, there are certain civics to uh, change that to cost nothing. Uh, but either way, if you decolonize a planet, it will actually cost 200 influence. This could not be reduced by any means and heavily nerfs any builds that rely on resettlement uh, in order to achieve a lot of pop growth. Otherwise, there's a nice quality of life of pop demotion time being halved, uh, although if you're already playing with a build that reduces pop demotion significantly, such as shared burdens, you actually will not experience as much of uh, benefit from it. So in a way, this actually is kind of a shared burdens nerf, uh, you won't get pops to almost instantly demote anymore, which is a bit of a shame. As far as Ringworld and Shattered Rings go, uh, there's been a pretty significant balance change. In fact, the balance changes are so significant, I would rank Shattered Ring pretty low on the tier list now. Uh, there's multiple things that happened. The first big change is that the size of the Ringworld has been doubled, uh, but all the districts have been halved in their power. Commercial districts in particular uh, become nowhere near as good because they now only provide two merchant jobs per district and uh, just a bunch of clerks otherwise and all the industrial stuff is moved to the industrial segment. Otherwise the research segment and the agriculture segment only have half as many jobs. This means that if you are playing with Shattered Ring and are relying on the arcane generator uh, to upkeep your districts 
Keep in mind that you will only have a free upkeep for half as many jobs. Additionally, if you're playing Ring World, you will not be getting any guaranteed habitable worlds near you, and combined with a previous change of having Ring World preference on your pops, uh, you really start off in a situation where you're kind of like Void Dweller, in that you can't really expand to planets because you don't have any, uh, but you also can't rapidly expand it to other habitats, so your growth is pretty significantly nerfed uh, if you're playing with Ring World, and your economy as a whole is nowhere near as good. You will also certainly have problems with minerals and energy. There are no energy jobs available on a ring world, and uh, actually that is a pretty significant loss in 3.0. The thing is, in 3.0, uh, farming for your food and then selling it on the market is nowhere near as potent. Technicians actually produce 6 base food per job, just like agricultural workers, which means that selling food on the market is no longer an efficient thing to do. It is instead much better to have technicians produce a whole bunch of energy credits, and uh, honestly this change is probably due to the new spying mechanics because you do need a whole bunch of energy uh, to try to interact and uh, really make use of that. Uh, also as you have already noticed, when it comes to ring world and any special uh, planet type such as for example a Eucumnopolis, a hive world, or a machine world, you actually start with all the building slots unlocked, which is very nice and you can actually uh, compensate somewhat for the lack of resources from districts by just spamming a whole bunch of buildings and getting resources that way. As far as habitats and void dwellers go, generally you won't have as many pops on habitats. Considering the new planet capacity mechanic and uh, how habitats really don't have a lot of planetary capacity, uh, you don't want a lot of pops per habitat. On this habitat I'm having to have four habitation districts uh, in order to make sure our population is under half capacity and is producing a good amount of extra growth from pops. Now if we were just playing normal Void Dweller, we probably wouldn't be so concerned with maximizing pop growth and instead we just make use of our habitats as much as possible. But even in that case, uh, if you're in a situation where you normally would be fine on housing and uh, jobs, in 3.0 you'd be filling up your planetary capacity and uh, you will have severely reduced pop growth on your planets. The most you can really get is 7 building slots. Uh, this empire in particular does not have the Voidborn Ascension perk, but with Voidborn and with adaptability, you should be able to get 7 slots, which is less than you would normally be able to get if you are playing 2.8. This does mean that even though Void Dwellers do get a bunch of bonuses for their habitats, uh, considering the small amount of population you really want on a habitat, uh, playing Void Dwellers is going to be a little weird. I have not personally played Void Dwellers in 3.0, I will and I will report uh, how it goes, but I don't think Void Dwellers will be as good as they are right now. In 3.0 we are also going to be getting a very nice uh, quality of life change to robots. Uh, simple robots can work all worker tier jobs, droids can work all specialist jobs, and synthetics can work all ruler jobs. If you have played around with robots in 2.8, you know that uh, having simple robots not able to do uh, technician work is extremely annoying. Another big change that you're going to see in 3.0 are the changes to authorities and ethics. Democratic will increase your automatic resettlement chance by 50%, oligarchic will increase your faction influence gain by 15%, dictatorial is going to reduce your empire's pro penalty, and imperial is going to increase your edict capacity. Out of all of these, Imperial is just straight up the best one. Uh, increasing automatic resettlement chance is nice, uh, but Democratic still sucks. Oligarchic is going to get slightly more influence, uh, but influence from factions is not really all that big. And uh, having a reduced Empire Sprawl penalty, uh, Paradox, you could come up with a better bonus than that. 10% is so insignificant, it's not even funny. On the upside, the Machine Intelligence Authority is actually getting a nice buff. They're getting plus one monthly pop assembly uh, that is base that is going to be added to uh, all of what they do. I've checked it out and uh, you don't actually get reduced roboticists or anything like that. You straight up just get extra growth, uh, which is very nice. Granted, Organics now have more means to uh, grow their empire faster, and as a Machine Intelligence you will not be subject to the growth curve. 
but overall having that extra pop assembly is going to help you out significantly. And as a Gestalt Consciousness in general, you're also going to get plus two encryption. Not too significant, but always nice to have. Uh, speaking of encryption, this leads us into uh, envoys and espionage. Overall, you're going to get a lot more envoys. Like, getting 10 envoys as an empire is uh, not going to be all that difficult to achieve. It is a bit of a shame that spying operations aren't all that powerful, uh, but it is nice that you have a lot more envoys to do stuff with. We also get some more uh, economic changes. For example, you have techs that increase uh, pop production by 10%, but increase their upkeep by 10% as well. These techs don't actually apply to your whole population, and only come into effect as you upgrade your capital. For example, your starting capital will only get plus 10% resources in exchange for plus 10% upkeep, while your more upgraded capitals will get a plus 30 in exchange for another plus 30. I think this has been added to sort of counterbalance the fact that you have less pops in the late game, because of the growth mechanics and because of how it's so much more difficult to grow pops in the late game. Uh, Production-wise, your subsidies are actually going to be significantly improved. Capacity, mining, and farming subsidies give a plus 50% output bonus. So for example, unlike before, uh, where capacity subsidies were basically a break-even edict, uh, now they're really good. Getting capacity subsidies will give you an effective 2.5 energy per technician, and uh, running it alongside the other subsidies is quite effective. Honestly, if you have a lot of influence in the early game, uh, getting these edicts and going over your edict cap would not be that bad of an idea. Early on, you can cover the extra uh, cost to Empire Sprawl relatively easily by just having a few pops extra dedicated to bureaucracy. And uh, in exchange, getting these bonuses is extremely good. Space resources are also going to scale a bit better in the late game, and you're going to be getting uh, a bit more production from that. In addition, your star base modules are going to be a bit better as well. For example, hydroponics bays produce a base of 10 food instead of 3 now, and they are actually affected by technologies, which is very nice. Here, we're getting 18 food out of a module with basically no upkeep, and uh, overall, I would recommend spamming and uh, getting as much star bases as you have capacity just to get access to these hydroponics bays and uh, solar panel arrays. Solar panels produce 6 energy each and uh, are quite significant. However, if you are playing a normal empire, you are out of luck. Uh, they did nothing to buff off-world trading companies and trade hubs, so keep dreaming. Otherwise, the most significant miscellaneous change uh, is the whole uh, endgame crisis thing. Now, at the start of the game, you can choose what crisis you want to fight or have a random crisis. And this random crisis is no longer going to be influenced by what sort of text you get, and instead just going to be purely random. Otherwise, there's quite a few more extra changes. Uh, you can pause the video and read through some of them. But the most significant of them all is Clone Vats. Clone Vats are quite expensive now, and have a pretty ridiculous 2 energy and 30 food upkeep. Now, they are quite good at giving you extra population, uh, with a plus three monthly pop assembly, but the insane cost is uh, gonna be something to consider. I do have to mention that this does stack with spawning pools if you're playing as a hive mind and are actually mutually exclusive with robot assembly. So you can't have cloning vats and robot assemblies produce pops at once. It's a bit of a dichotomy. Either you go for normal pops or you go for robots. And so if you're going for a biological ascension path, uh, you will not be able to have a lot of robots in your empire. Which is honestly a bit of a nerf considering how good robots tend to be. Granted, your pop growth is going to be increased, and in fact, uh, a fully biologically ascended empire does have more pop growth than a fully synthetically ascended empire, with uh, unorganic species growing alongside the robots. But it's a pretty insignificant difference. I think it's like what, one pop growth per month. And uh, you also have to consider that late game, Pop growth is significantly reduced, and having more efficient pops is just so much better. In 3.0, Synthetic Ascension is still going to be the go-to Ascension, uh, because of the sheer amount of resources that you get from having all your pops be robots. Otherwise, there's been a pretty significant change to the Prosperous Unification Origin. The insane bonus of extra production, extra amenities, and extra happiness 
only last 10 years. The bonus is still the same and you still do get the districts and pops, but considering this uh, 10 year expiration date, a lot of other origins that are very similar in effect to planetary unification are going to be quite competitive. For example, Machine World. Normally you would never want to use Machine World because yeah, planetary unification is just plain better, uh, but now it's a pretty competitive alternative. As far as 3.0.1 balancing changes go, uh, it's mostly just uh, fixing whatever they didn't get in 3.0. Uh, the 3.0.1 update is pretty big, especially when it comes to bug fixes. So I think what Paradox wanted to do was, you know, hammer out all the features in 3.0, and then they realized they had extra time, and so they worked on uh, fixing a bunch of stuff in 3.0.1. As far as automation goes, uh, Sector AI is supposedly better. Uh, I would never trust my planets to be managed by an AI, but it is nice to know, though, that it's uh, no longer going to spam uh, precinct houses whenever you have a crime lord deal on a planet uh, to try to get rid of all that evil nasty crime. Now as far as performance and stability goes uh, I have noticed that uh, doing multiplayer in 3.0 is a bit more stable when it comes to uh, hot joins like for example in the Nemesis Cold War game we had a dozen hot joins and none of them desynced and uh, we even had people do stuff while the game was paused and uh, upon unpausing the game didn't desync so Pretty impressed. As far as UI, uh, there has been two very significant options added in the outliner. Unlike previously, where you just uh, had new planets pop up in your outliner, you can actually sort planets. For example, if I want uh, my mining world to be on top, I can make it go there. And uh, I can have it customized or sorted. For example, if I have pops by population, pops will go in descending or ascending order by population. This is very nice and I am very happy that they finally added this feature. Otherwise there is an extra option in outliner options which you get by clicking this little uh, gear icon to show colony designation icons. It is extremely nice uh, when you're managing 50 planets to know exactly uh, what they're specialized as and uh, this also means that you don't have to name your planets uh, minerals A or minerals B in all caps and uh, can actually have proper planetary names. It's a small quality of life fix, but honestly, if they just introduced this in a DLC, I would buy the DLC immediately. I've been waiting for this sort of functionality for a very long time. An additional quality of life feature is if someone pauses the game in multiplayer, they actually get a paused icon uh, by their name, so you can immediately tell who actually paused the game, so you can bully them and uh, call them names, because Pausing the game in multiplayer is a very naughty thing to do. Otherwise, as usual, you have plenty of uh, small UI tweaks. Uh, you also have plenty of AI tweaks. AI is a bit better. They do feel bigger fleets now. Uh, but, you know, uh, I played a few games and even on Grand Admiral, AI still stands no chance against a proper empire. However, I am extremely interested in uh, seeing what an AI with a better economy could do with a mod like Starnet, uh, which makes it aggressive and uh, makes it build up its fleets quite a bit more. Another big feature of 3.0 is the different modding options. You have a lot of stuff uh, to mod, and uh, while I am not personally a programmer, uh, this certainly looks impressive. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, now let's get to another juicy part of this update and that is bug fixes. Now, just like the modding options, there's a whole bunch of bug fixes. Uh, I have only encountered a few of those, and uh, I will refer to you the ones that I think are important and uh, those that I've met before. For example, uh, the bug where synthetically ascended empires can't actually block the ghost signal. Uh, well, now they can. And how terraformation could sometimes uh, leave a visual glitch on your map where there be a half terraformed planet just floating about in space. I'm very glad that this is no longer a thing, and uh, if there's any animation in progress when you're in a system, jumping out of the system will not cause massive visual errors across your galaxy map. The developers also fixed what I used to lovingly call Operation Barbarossa, where if you rival someone in a non-aggression pact, there would be no truce, and so you'll be able to just go ahead and attack them, just like uh, what happened in 1941. 
Otherwise, decent quality of life, uh, you will no longer get as much notification spam when the galactic community is formed and you meet a whole bunch of vampires. Very nice feature. I noticed the uh, absurd lack of uh, empire spam when I got to that point in multiple games. There are a lot of bug fixes in 3.0.1, but the most significant among them is that slaves working specialist jobs will no longer get worker bonuses. This used to be extremely powerful with slaver guilds. You'd have uh, slavers with a lot of modifiers to worker jobs, and in the end they produced a whole bunch of science when working as researchers. That is no longer the case. And uh, because of that, slaver guilds is uh, gonna be experiencing a pretty significant nerf. Otherwise, there's been one bug fix that gave me a very, very good and healthy idea. Here it says that there was a fix for star eaters uh, not actually giving the relevant armor technologies to the user. The thing with Star Eaters is that you get them uh, when you go ahead and go down the Crisis path and reach level 5 of Crisis. It is relatively difficult to achieve this level. Uh, you need 10,000 metas and you need to do a bunch of special projects to become the Crisis. But once you do and you get to level 5, you get two Star Eaters which are heavily advanced. In theory, you can achieve uh, the status of a level 5 Crisis relatively early. Uh, you can get the Ascension perk for becoming the Crisis as your third one, and if you rush down Metis and uh, you know either reassemble Pops or do some other shenanigans with this and get to level 5 Crisis, you're going to be able to get a lot of good technologies out of it. Now granted, this will not be easy, and you will have to spend a lot of research trying to go through all these special crisis projects, but if you manage to pull it off and get the engine and the two star eaters, you will also have researched all the technologies that go along with it, which actually amounts to a pretty significant chunk of tech. This tech includes all the different uh, variants of ships, strike craft, thrusters, armor, uh, shields, jump drives, and actually dark matter reactors as well. Dark matter reactors are something that you generally will not have access to unless you go ahead and blow up a fallen empire, which uh, in our case, and uh, in the case of a few of my single player games, we didn't do. Anyways, that's gonna do it for the patch notes. Uh, this is a very, very long list of patch notes, uh, far more than the usual update. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed me covering the most important bits and demonstrating them in-game. Anyways, thank you all for watching. I'll be covering a lot of these topics again in separate, dedicated videos soon. So please stay tuned, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.